I have been working as a data scientist in the US tech industry for over 10 years now. And in these 10 years, I have worked at some of the biggest brand names in the world like Meta, Cisco, and Wells Fargo. And in this video, I'm going to share with you the top five lessons which I've learned working in the industry as a data scientist. And these are the lessons which now I wish someone had told me when I started my career 10 years ago. So if you are someone who is just getting started as a data scientist and or even exploring data science as a career choice for you, then I hope some of these lessons will be very valuable to you as you make further progress in your career. So starting with the very first lesson, which I want to share with you is having a right balance between hard skills and soft skills. Now, let me first clarify what do I mean by hard skills and soft skills. So hard skills are mainly your technical skills, which are gauged during interview process. It could be your coding skills, your knowledge of different machine learning algorithms, your SQL skills. So all of these things which are technical, which can be gauged in an interview setting very easily, these are your hard skills. And then soft skills are like communication or curiosity or all these things which makes you, which are very difficult to judge in a short setting. These are all the soft skills. And generally what happens is that to get a job, you have to be very good at hard skills because in most of the interviews, you will be asked some technical questions. And if you are good at solving those technical questions, then your ability to land a job, then your chances of getting a job are much higher. So hard skills play a very big role in terms of getting the job. Now, in terms of succeeding at the job, once you have got that job, it is usually the soft skills which play a very big role in comparison to your soft skills. Most of the times, what you would see is that the person who is most successful on the job, they might not have very good technical skills, but as long as they are a very good person to deal with, they have very good communication skills, they are very curious about the company, the project, the job which uh, you are doing, and they take ownership of the project, they take pain about it, then these are all the soft skills which help you succeed at the job once you have got that job. So basically, hard skills help you get the job, and soft skills help you excel at the job once you have got the job, of course. And when I say that you have to have a balance between both, so let's examine two extremes for me to help make the point here. So let's say scenario one is of a someone who is a job hopper, and that person just focuses on their technical skills and they don't care about the soft, developing soft skills, they don't care about the what the company is doing, taking ownership about the project. They are not curious about company's products, how the company is doing marketing, anything at all. So that person is just focusing on their technical skills because they know that this is the technical skills which help them land this job. And if they keep sharpening that technical skill, this will open doors for them to get the second job and then the third job. So usually with that kind of approach, the people who are very good at technical skills and they do not care much about soft skills, they keep changing jobs every two to three years. So now this has a lot of pros because as you keep changing jobs, your salary generally keeps increasing. Also, your ability to go towards better companies, it is also very high. The downside of this is that you're always operating with some sort of a split personality because on the job, you are trying to do the work for that company and you're trying to at least to some level communicate your loyalty and your interest in that company. But on the other side, you are continuously preparing and giving interviews and sharpening your hard skills, which help you clear those interviews. The other downside is that if you keep doing this for long enough, 10 years, 15 years, then you come to a stage that you will be applying for senior roles. And when you apply for those senior roles, and companies look at your profile that you have been job switching every two to three years, then that goes against you because companies want to bring in senior people who are loyal and sincere about the company purpose and cause. So this is one career path if you just focus on the technical skills. The other path is that if you just focus on your soft skills and you take ownership about the project, you are very curious about how your company is doing, what your company is doing, and you keep 
investing in that, then there is a good chance that you will keep getting promotions in your current job. And you don't have to really look around um, to find some other jobs. And also the split personality, which I talked about in the other case, you don't have that. You are fully committed about this one company, this one purpose, and you don't have to worry about preparing for something on the side. You can just focus 100% of your attention towards the job you have at hand and you can just keep excelling at it. And if you look at a lot of very successful people, for example, CEO of Google or CEO of Microsoft or CEO of Cisco, you can see that this is the pattern they had. They just started their career with one company and then they keep climbing ladders within that company and build a reputation and brand around it. But the downside of this approach for most people is that they do not become CEOs of these companies. What ends up happening is that you are familiar with just how one company works. And within that company, you definitely can grow a lot. But if for some reason that company fires you, then since you do not have a lot of hard skill knowledge, you will be struggling a lot to get the second job or any other job. And that makes you vulnerable. So basically both options of just focusing on hard skills or just focusing on soft skills have their own pros and cons. And generally both of these extremes are not a very good strategy. I think a good overall strategy is that you stay on the side of focusing on your hard skills in the beginning of your career. So it's okay that if you switch jobs from every two to three years for your first two to three jobs, but afterwards, once you have gained some experience and you have gotten into a good enough company, then it's time for you to start focusing on your soft skills so that you could stay in that company long enough and get promotions and develop a reputation of being a reliable, a loyal, and a dependable person. So this is the first lesson which I wanted to talk to you about. The second lesson is having some sort of a strategy in terms of building your hard skills. So when it comes to developing some expertise around your different technical skill set, there are two main approaches. One is that you focus on breadth first, which is that you try to become a jack of all trades and you try to learn a little bit of all the skill sets which are needed for that job. The other option is that you go depth first, which is that you try to develop as much of an expertise as possible into a very narrow field. Now both have their pros and cons, but again, my suggestion to someone who is getting started would be to have a mix of both and have a T-shaped learning roadmap which is breadth as well as depth in a specific area. For example, in data science, you have to know pretty much everything about most of the things you need to know about at some depth. So that gives you a lot of breadth, but you do not have very deep expertise in all of it. And then you pick one thing and then you go really deep into it. So this is called a T-shaped model of developing your expertise around your hard skills. So what it would actually look like is that in the very beginning of your career, maybe for the first one to two years, you just try to develop a little bit of everything which there is a need to know. So you need something about data, you are good at Python at a certain level, you know SQL, you know how does Docker work, how does Git work, and all those skill sets and tools you know at a decent enough level that you can function effectively as a data scientist. And then after one to two years, you would understand that what is one thing which is in demand and you have some personal interest in going deep into, it could be a recommendation engine thing. For me personally, it was a lot of work around natural language processing because most of the data I was dealing with was text and I really liked getting to understand that how different natural language processing worked. And this is before the Gen AI thing even got started. But in your case, it could be something different. It could be recommendation engines. It could be anything, maybe expertise around Gen AI or maybe expertise around neural networks. But whatever it is, then you pick one thing and then you keep going down that lane. And once you have figured out what your T-shape strategy looks like, then over the period of time, you can keep expanding the breadth of your knowledge so that you know about more things and you also keep increasing the depth of whatever area of your specialization is so that you know more about that specific thing. The third lesson which I have learned is that 
one should prioritize getting into a fang company or an equivalent bigger brand name as soon in their career as possible. Now, a lot of people, including myself, we keep deferring that goal because we think that getting into a fang is very, very hard and almost impossible and we'll never be able to do it. But the thing is that if you have the right guidance and you know that what the interview format for these bigger companies look like, and then you have a very dedicated preparation plan, then I believe anyone can get into fan company. It is just a matter of having clarity of goal in terms of you want to get into what kind of company and then having clarity on what kind of skill sets you need to get into that company. As long as you have these two, then in a matter of a year's preparation, you can definitely have a very fair chance of getting into some FANG companies. Now, getting into FANG have their own pros and cons. The biggest pro is that you get a big brand name on your resume. And once you have that big brand name on your resume, for the rest of your career, it makes the process of finding another job just much, much easier. And not only it helps you find jobs, once you land a job, people just treat you differently because you're coming from such an established company. So this is definitely the biggest reason you should try to get into FANG, even if you have thoughts otherwise. The second reason is that the talent pool or the kind of people which are working for these fan companies, they are just phenomenal. And when you work on projects with those people, you get to learn a lot of things which you not have been able to learn otherwise. And the third similar reason is that the processes of project management, of tool usage, of documentation, of promotions you would see there, they are much better as compared to a lot of other companies. So having exposure to those processes and systems, it really helps you put things into perspective. So when you go to the other companies, you can definitely take a lot of takeaway lessons from those FANG days and maybe implement them in the other companies. Now, the main downside of working at FANG is that first, you are just a very small part in a very big organization or machine and that leads to sometimes thinking that the work you're doing is not significant and the other thing is burnout usually these fan companies um, they have very strict processes in place in terms of performance management and that is the reason that the average stay at companies like meta google is two years because after two years people are just so burnt out and they have some good opportunities outside that they just go to towards the other opportunities and pursue them instead but still i think get into a fang at least once in the beginning of your career and after that you can make a decision of do you want to stay in fangs or go in some other companies but do not rule it out without getting in first because you don't know what you are rejecting uh, till you get there. And as someone who has been there, I would highly recommend that at least once in your career, ideally in the beginning, you should try to get into a fan company. Now, the fourth lesson which I would share, and this is mainly about developing soft skills, is that over a period of time, I've seen that data storytelling, over the period of time, I've seen that as a data scientist, the number one skill which helps you get your promotions and excel at the job which you are doing is the skill of data storytelling. And the reason this is the number one skill is that in most jobs, especially in, in data science, as you go to the senior levels, that in most jobs, especially data science jobs, your ability to sell something is the key thing which you should be very good at. And by selling, I mean, even when you're talking with your seniors, you should be able to demonstrate the work you are doing in a very positive light. When you are talking to your juniors, you should be able to convince them and make and motivate them so that they could effectively work on the project which you want them to work on. And same goes to your peers. So selling is what you are doing on pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis, even if you are not dealing with customers. Within the company, when you're talking with your boss, you're selling. When you're talking with your peers, you are selling. When you're talking with your juniors, uh, you are selling. And the best way of selling is through storytelling. And since we are working with data, if you could use data to back up your stories and show it in a way which is easier to understand and help them convince on whatever you want them to convince, then that is a very maybe subtle soft skill 
but it goes a long way in, in terms of succeeding at the job you have at hand. And one thing to keep in mind, which I've learned over the uh, last couple of years, is that the PowerPoints which you build, they have very long shelf life because that you develop a pitch in a PowerPoint. It could be a presentation about a project or something else. And your manager thinks that work is good, so they would present it to someone else using the same slides or similar slides. And then their manager, when they want to share something about that project, that those same deck of slides get shared. And this not only goes towards the higher management, your juniors as well, when they have to talk about the project you have created some PowerPoints, those same PowerPoints get created. So if you have done a good job of creating those PowerPoints, then more and more people are more likely to use that. And that helps establish credibility. And the good part is that this skill is not very hard to learn. I had just gone through one training. It was an in-person training about data storytelling. And I think that just changed my way of how I create slides now. And, and it's not that I'm very good at it. It's just that before and after, there's just so much difference with a single training. It was two-day training. And the reason I'm highlighting this is that any of you can spend two days. You don't have to go to that training. There are some books which you can use. Data Storytelling is, is an excellent book, by the way. So if you spend some time trying to hone in that skill, that will pay you a lot of dividends for a long period of time. Now, the fifth and the last thing which I want to share is that data science is a process of never-ending learning. This is just the nature of the job. And I want you to embrace the fact that once you become a data scientist, on a daily basis, you should have some dedicated time when you're learning new things. And you do not see that as a problem, but as an opportunity. Because using all these state-of-the-art things, those new shiny tools and technology, you'll be able to deliver impact, which is much, much more as compared to a lot of other conventional software engineering fields. I have some friends who have been working on Java or Oracle databases. And it's very interesting to know that in the last 10 years, there is very little change which happened for some of these technologies. And when I compare myself against, I have to spend a lot of time trying to learn new things as compared to my other peers who are working in those fields. Now, if you do not have a right mindset, you might think that this is a bad thing because you have to do an extra work of learning everything. But if you look at it from a positive angle, then I am very glad that I have to learn a lot of new things. I have an opportunity to work on the latest and greatest innovations which the science has to offer. And by virtue of learning for the last 10 years, I have just learned so much. And all that accumulated knowledge is really helping me get better jobs or being good at the job I am currently doing. And it also protects me from the competition that when I am applying for roles which require this kind of skill set, there are not a lot of other people so who have spent last 10 years learning so much about uh, different data science concepts. So know that daily learning is part of your data science journey. It will continue to be the case for the next 30 years. So if this is something you don't like, then maybe it's a time to change the career to something else. But if you come into data science, then, then this is something you should embrace. I've created a different video on the topic of what I think are the worst advice which is misleading a lot of people. The link for that video should be somewhere here. Please check it out. Thank you so much for watching.